Chapter Three: Building a Paper Route One Customer at a Time. I was 14 years old in November 1935 when President Franklin D. Roosevelt came to Atlanta to dedicate Techwood Homes, the nation's first federally subsidized housing project. A short while later, our family moved into one of those new units, 466 Techwood Drive, apartment 22. At age of 56. Mother was tired. Running a boarding house for over a decade had worn her out. Plus, our family was, for all intended and purposes, bankrupt. We owed thirty-five dollars at the grocery store, and there was no way we are going to have to get that much money anytime soon. Moving out of the neighborhood while owing so much money disturbed mother terribly. She believed that somehow, someday, she would pay the money back. But she didn't know when or how. It wasn't until I was in the military service that I accumulated enough money to repay. Repay. When I showed up with the money, so many years later, the gro- the grocer had forgotten about it, but mother and I hadn't. When we moved to Techwood Home, nineteen thirty-five, my older siblings had gone, grown and moved out, so only my younger brother Ben and I were at home. The family determined that with my father's meager income from selling insurance policies, along with money Ben and I could earn from newspaper routes, we could cut our expenses and pay the rent and utilities sixty-seven dollars a month. Ben and I were given responsibility for entire Techwood Home Project, nine city blocks of a multi-house apartments, for the Atlanta Journal. An afternoon paper newspaper. We both had delivered papers in the West End, but Techwood gave us a different kind of challenge. Every apartment was new, so every subscriber was new. We in, didn't inherit a base someone else had created. We built our own business, one customer at a time. We had plenty of competition from Atlanta Constitution in the morning, and the Atlanta Georgian. Another afternoon paper, and of course, many paper took no newspaper at all. People, I had to prove each customer that I would do the right job, then follow through on my commitment. The key to succeeding to with newspaper and the restaurant business, I would rather learn is take care of the customer. I had to do the job, what whether I felt like it or not. I was. If I was running a fever, or if we were in the middle of a thunderstorm, or electrical lines were on the ground, or we had an ice storm, my customers expect their their paper to be delivered. To keep my customers, and it's always easier to keep a customer than to replace one. I did more than sling the paper hazard happily toward to the front door. I put it where the customer asked me to put it. An elderly customer often had a rocking chair beside the front door, and I placed the, the paper in the chair seat so that they wouldn't have to bend over. Some people had dogs running around and required required me to put the newspaper behind the screen door. It might have been easier to tell the customer, "You put the dog up, and you won't have to get a chewed paper." But I didn't. I don't do that. Not if you want to keep the customer. The customer is always right. I always oblige the customer. But you don't do that. Not if you want to keep customer. The customer is always right, and I always oblige the customer. Jimmy Collins, longtime president of Chick Fil A, talks about how I built my restaurant business in the beginning the same way. With the customer that other restaurants ran off, the people who came to my first restaurant had been eating somewhere other than with me. So I built my business on those cast-offs. Ever since I was a teenager delivering newspaper, I had tried not to lose a single customer. I treated each one like the one most important person in the world. And delivered each paper it as if I was delivering it to the front door of a governor's mansion. 
decent image that still works to improve customer service. If you are working in the restaurant and suddenly President of the United States showed up, your voice and facial expression will change. You'll be eager to serve the President well. Make sure he had a clean table, then go up and see if everything was all right and if he needed anything. If we are willing to do that for the President, why not treat every customer that well? My friend Mike Macon, Dean Merritt of Georgia State University College of Business Administration, tells a story of a ordering a Coca-Cola with no ice at a restaurant, not a Chick-fil-A. The girl behind the counter brought a Coke with ice. I ordered without ice, Mike said politely. So the girl put the finger over the, over the top of the cup, poured the uh, Coke into another cup, filled it with top, and handed it to Mike. Maintaining his composure, he asked, could I have another Coke with no eyes and no fingers? I don't know if he ever came, went back to that restaurant. Atlanta Varsity Drive-In restaurant was the first to show me an importance of treating the customer right. It was only a mile away from us when we lived in Techwood Homes, and it was the hangout place for teenagers. I did most of my courting at the varsity. Frank Gordy, the owner, was always there to make sure customers were taken care of correctly. Our favorite curve server were Flossie May, Flossie May, who dressed in an outrageous hat that looked like a giant fruit basket, and Hot Papa. Despite earning only nickel or dime tip from teenager, college students, they always give us good service. Courtesy is cheap to provide, and it pays great dividend. My satisfied newspaper customer, 65 years ago, became my cheerleader and they boosted my business. When a leader, the reader of the Georgian complained that paper came late, or not at all, my customers replied, responded that theirs always arrived on time. Pretty soon, I had another customer who I didn't directly solicited. The most effective way of promoting my business didn't cost me anything but a little kindness. My success as a newspaper delivery boy always depended upon my capability as a business manager. I bought my paper wholesale, then sold them retail, and it was up to me to decide how to make a profit. A customer pay weekly, 25 cents. A few pay two weeks at a time, and I always had few didn't pay at all. Whenever I knocked on the door, no one answered, so I watched if any light on inside at 10 p.m. I tried to collect them, keep them from falling more than a couple of weeks behind. Others would lag behind on purpose, then move away without pain. I lost the income as well as the wholesale cost of the paper. Some people will beat you out of money if they can. Techwood Homes turned out to be a great place for a paper route. I learned that pocket knives and t-shirt and other pe- <laughs> presses from the Oilers Journal attracted new customers. So I won a trip to a Jacksonville Beach award in the, the newspaper with the most new customers every year. They loaded us into the back of a newspaper truck and carry us down there where I saw ocean for the first time. My family never my family never left town except for visiting relatives occasionally, so those beach trips were my vacation. I delivered papers at Techwood Homes until I joined the army. It was more comfortable in the winter than most neighborhood because I made deliveries out of out of the weather. I got my exercise running up and down the steps. On the summer evening, people brought chairs outside and visited, giving us a strong sense of community. And Mr. Dunk Drink Car, superintendent of the project, maintained the place with respect. I didn't cut. I didn't dare to cut corners and step on grass, or how he would call my hand on it. Sometimes at night, I would walk out of lie down in the Melba maintained grace, gazed up in the sky, and realized the presence of the Lord, and despite our dire financial circumstances. On a Saturday during the football season, Georgia Tech played its game at the Grand Field, just a couple blocks away from our apartments. 
Uh, for a while, I had a job selling peanut on the stand. Later, I bought my first car, a hump mobile, hump mo hump mobile that cost me ten dollars. It didn't have a battery, so all I to always made a point of parking on the hill with an easy rolling jump start, and I drove people from distant parking area to stadium for a, tr a tip. Sun Sunday morning was a criti cru critical day for the newspaper delivery boy. I had to start long before the daylight to take care of all my customers. The new the Sunday paper was thick to four fold and too heavy to carry more than a few few at a time. The fathers of the some paper boys would help their son deliver Sunday paper, especially in the bad weather, carrying the bundle in their running board of the car to design, designated drop points for every few blocks. My father never did. I often felt cheated, especially on Sunday morning during my early teen years because I did not have a loving and caring father. My Sunday, my Sunday school teacher recognized how somehow that I had a father who never told me that I, he would love me. Or perhaps he saw in demeanor that I was a boy who had never said I love you to my father. I think he sensed my isolation because he reached out to me and became the model of a loving and caring father. My, my teacher's name was Theo Abbey. He owned a small company that supplied the steam fittings and he and his wife had two sons. One of them was Ted, was my age. Through his teaching, Mr. Abbey gave me a better understanding of the Bible, but more important, he displayed to me a loving, caring spirit. He visited Techwood homes often to see me and others in the Sunday school class. He also invited us occasionally to go with him and Ted to his cabin, Lake, John, Lake Jackson. There I witnessed a loving relationship between father and his son. So in time, I came to understand that I could choose the type of model I would follow in life. And I choose the example of a Theo Abbey. Now then, I encounter the children whose father who not participate in their lives. I try to establish a relationship with them. I had taught 13 year old boys in Sunday school for nearly half century and through the contact, I have tried to identify these, those boys who didn't have a father who live divided homes. I often give those children more attention than I do those with a stable home life. Over the years, I have become a substitute father and grandfather to dozens of children, as Mr. Abby did for me for 65 years ago. Financial problem followed my family to Techwood Homes. Even at $67 a month, we could not afford to live in a government subsidized housing without the income the mother had generated running the boarding house. My father profited from selling insurance and remained close to zero, and Ben and I didn't make enough money to meet our newspaper routes. My sister Esther, who never allowed her ch childhood about with polio to stop her and taking teaching position and then and sent 10 or $20 a month to help us. But even that wasn't enough, so we located a house in Mortal Street just as Pond de Leon Avenue, east of downtown Atlanta. Mother came out of retirement and went back to work and cooking for the boarders. I maintained my paper route back at Techwood Home even after we moved away, and my business grew under my understanding that customers are always looking for somebody who is dependable and polite and will take care of them. It's ironic that in those years, on the few occasions when I went into a department store, I was treated royally even though I had a little money to spend. The salespeople dressed well, wearing clothes similar to the merchandise they were selling, and they're well-mannered and groomed. Nowadays, high fashion stores have a difficult attracting the training good people, and their customer service is becoming lost art. My success with the newspaper route convinced me that I would one day open a business of my own, most likely service station or grocery store or restaurant. As a high school student, I had a choice of attending college, prepare to school, tech high, or Boys High, or I could attend the Commercial High in downtown Atlanta, which offered courses geared for boys who did not plan to go to college. I chose a Commercial High and I took a business course such as bookkeeping and typing. To graduate, I had to pass a shorthanded, pass shorthand, which would never interest in me. When I flunked the course, I had realized that I would have to switch my major from business to the bookkeeping and stay in school for another year and a half to graduate. 
Then my, my kind principal reviewed my transcript and told me that I could switch to tech high and graduate on time without repeating a shorthand. I jumped the opportunity. Before I left the commercial high, however, I took an elective course called Everyday Living, EDL, which turned out to be one of my most meaningful high school classes. Our ELD teacher taught us about common courtesy and as well as the common sense, how to dress for an interview, to remove the head in the elevator when the lady is present, how to present yourself to a stranger. He also introduced me to a boy, Napoleon Hill, that had just published Think and Grow Rich. Grow Rich. In it, Mr. Hill wrote, Whatever the mind of the man is conceived, it believe it can be achieved. You believe that? I want you to believe that, Enoch, and I want to show you. It wasn't all that bright. I had a difficult keeping up in class, and I had always carried with me a bit of the uh, inferiority complex regarding the socia socializing at school. I was already losing my hair, and I never felt confident about dating girls, but I enjoyed my work, and I enjoyed the reward of the working. As I read Mr. Hill's book, I realized I could do anything if I wanted badly enough. His word motivated me and showed me that I, I live in do it all my yourself world. The Bible says that all things work together for good to them. Love the Lord and love them who are calling according to His purpose. Romans 8, 28. I never thought that I would, it would mean my balding head would keep me out of World War II, but it did. Instead of being sent home from front line, I fought the war in the typewriter. When I graduated from high school, I went to work as an administrative clerk in a, for an Army major in Atlanta Ordnance Department, Depot, which is now known as Fort Glenn. I skipped three pay grades to replace the man who was 30, 35 or old in part, I believe, that because my thinning hair made me look older than I was. My position put me in a contact with a, the upper echelon on the post and I was able to avoid draft for a while. When I was eventually drafted, the, com the commanding officer and his adjunction requested that I be assigned in the position in Atlanta. In other words, no book came for me. I still needed 60 weeks of basic training under my army regulation. So, so, word. we will march up and down the street in Candace and just two of us quite, con quite conspicuously without him barking orders. And some people would go by laughing. They thought I was being punished. That time in Atlanta turned out to be a gift from God, which I, I, I had been sent overseas. I would have missed some of the wonderful final days with my mother. My parents had finally retired from the boarding house business and moved into the uh, Jack and Burn, Georgia. My sister Esther had bought a home there and invited them to live with her. It was not fancy living. The house has no indoor plumbing. But those who were sweet days, my father started going back to the church again and was more pleasant with, with, live with. On Father's Day, would hitchhike down to the uh, spend the weekend with them, and Mother would take care of me. In a cold night, they shoot a vampire and put a put a foot on my bed to keep me warm. I, various family member, installed the bathroom and running the water and house and make it more reliable. I eventually had to leave Atlanta when the company commanded officers sent me to visit Louisiana for two months. Out of sight. Nearly Near end of the World War, I finally came out from the behind the desk and I was signed to the medical unit for in Fort Lewis, Washington for overseas duties. While waiting in the to ship out, however, I developed a strange sensitivity to sunlight. The slight exposure to skin was that was not normally exposed made of me break out in hives. If I rolled my sleeves out in the sun, the rash would appear in a matter of seconds. It rained almost every day in Fort Lewis, but the limit, limited sun we got seemed to make my problem worse. I went to the infirmary and was put in the hospital where doctors would give me medication and send me out, send me out in the sun. Nothing they gave me seemed to work. There was no way they could ship me out in the South Pacific as was the Army's intention. They might have sent me back to the desk job, but instead, doctor recommended that I discharge and I was out. I got on a train bound for Georgia, Georgia in the Southern California. And the way and every stop along the way the sun was shining, I forced myself out into it. First, just a few seconds, then for a longer period until my strength sensitivity disappeared. But discharge, discharge 
turned out to be a special blessing. Shortly after I arrived in the Georgia, mother was 65 years old and had appendicitis that was misdiagnosed and as indigestion. By the time the doctor realized what was happening, her appendix had ruptured and the, and periodically had sent, sent, set in. I was thankful to have had those last few visits with her.